two, three, four, test. Hi, Ben. This is Corey from SEC. Oh, hello. Did you hear the test? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. It was a long night. How are you doing today? Doing good. How are you? Doing very well. Very uh, <clears throat> excited for this opportunity here and been working and getting used to this new world. Yeah, definitely. Um, we'll probably give it a couple more minutes to see if um, any more people hop on the webinar and then um, we'll give a brief introduction to Mass EC and what the Spotlight series is, then we'll have you give your presentation and we'll try to leave about 15 minutes for questions. Okay, that sounds yeah. perfect. Great. Muted. All right. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us virtually for a Mass CC Clean Tech Spotlight webinar series presentation. To briefly cover some housekeeping items, all attendees are currently in listen only mode. We'll start by quickly introducing the webinar series, then we'll introduce the guest speaker for today's webinar and let them present on their company and technology. Following the presentation, there will be roughly 15 minutes reserved for questions from the audience. If you have a question, please use the question submission feature and type it in as the presentation is happening and we can ask them on your behalf. Now to give a short introduction to MassCC's work, MassCC's Tech Dev Program Suite consists of three different grant programs, Catalyst, Amplify, and Innovate. Each of these programs target providing support to clean tech startups and researchers at different points in their technical and commercial development from prototyping to demonstration with industrial partners. Today's presentation is a catalyst guarantee. Ben Sorkin will present on his company, Flux Marine. Flux Marine is designing, manufacturing, and marketing high-performance electric marine propulsion systems for the boating industry. These developments replace highly polluting conventional gas upwards across the globe. Thank you again for joining us and please enjoy the presentation. Hello everybody, <clears throat> this is Ben Sorkin. Thank you very much for taking the time to tune in today and thank you very much to the Mass DEC for organizing this spotlight series. It's great to be on here today. So, my company is Flux Marine, and we founded Flux Marine to build a better boat motor. Next slide. <clears throat> the journey of Flux Marine started back in 2016 when I was an undergraduate at Princeton University in my dorm room. The automotive industry was undergoing an electrification revolution. You saw cars like the Chevy Volt, Nissan Leaf, and then Tesla popping up, really a paradigm shift in the automotive industry. But if we looked at the marine industry, we did not see those same things. There hasn't been a large technology push since the widespread adoption of four-stroke motors nearly 20 years ago, and the marine industry has truly been stagnant. It's an industry that is in need of sustainable innovation. Next slide. 
Growing up on the water in upstate New York, we learned that boat stands for one thing. And for those of you who own a boat, you might know that boat stands for bust out another thousand. So countless times have I been out on the water with my friends, my family, my co-founders, where we've lost time due to broken flywheels, spark plugs going bad, or leaky gaskets. Boats are inherently known for their high maintenance requirements and low reliability. In addition, they're extremely loud. <clears throat> I can count numerous times where I would wanna take the boat out early in the morning or late at night, and instead of turning the engine on, I actually paddled about 500 feet out, to, out on the lake before I could turn the engine on so I didn't wake up all the neighbors. Fueling is also really expensive on boats. I remember when I was about 13 years old, I had a little Boston whaler and I would take the six gallon gas tank and drag it up the street to the local gas station to fill it up because the fuel on land was about a dollar cheaper than the fuel on the water. There's an increasing amount of restrictive use, tens of thousands of waterways across the US and abroad that are banning gasoline engines in favor of quieter, more sustainable electric motors and the pollution behind electric behind gas boats is really mind boggling. Looking at the next slide, diving a little bit more into the quantifiable measures of these issues with gas engines. About $1,500 a year is expected in just scheduled maintenance of gas engines. Extremely loud, we're looking at about 90 decibels at wide open throttle. There's a reason that crew teams have coaching boats where the coaches are sitting next to these outboard engines all day long, and most of them do end up needing hearing aids or suffering from some sort of sound according to that, um, from that noise from the engines. Combustion engines have hundreds of moving parts, which makes them really susceptible to corrosion and early failure. Like we said before, over 10,000 waterways have banned gas engines. Fueling is one to two dollars more expensive per gallon than on land. And in addition to the CO2 created by motors, outboard engines do not have catalytic converters. So <clears throat> as far as NOx, SOx, and other particulate matter, outboard engines release over 100 times as much per gallon burn as does a car. Next slide. Looking more at the pollution, <clears throat> boating is extremely energy and power intensive. So one hour of boating on a family-sized boat requires or creates about the same emissions as driving a car for 800 miles. Direct fuel emissions also exist. Boats discharge over 150 million gallons of unburned gasoline annually. For reference, this is an, about an order of magnitude or 15 times greater than the Exxon Valdez oil spill. Next slide. Looking at what electrification of the U.S. recreational marine market could do, we see that about 100% market adoption would get to around 13 million megatons of CO2 reduction. For reference, this is equivalent to about 3 million cars. These are some ground up assumptions that we made, and <clears throat> the actual figures globally are likely much higher. Next slide. The marine industry as a whole produces a tremendous amount of emissions. This slide here shows more so past the recreational market where Flux Marine is focused, all the way up to the global shipping market, where we see the global shipping is responsible for nearly 3% of global CO2 emissions. And on NOx and SOx, it's anywhere from 18 to 30%. While Flux Marine is initially addressing the recreational high-speed small craft market, we will be looking <clears throat> towards these larger markets and these larger offenders in the future. Next slide. So how come people haven't really made electric motors? Why don't we see electric boats in the same fashion that we see electric cars? There are a lot of challenges. There are operational obstacles, environmental challenges, and of course, adoption. So <clears throat> looking at some of the operational obstacles, Continuous discharge is a concept that comes into play. When a car is accelerating on the highway, <clears throat> it can use a couple hundred horsepower. Once it's at steady state on the highway, you're looking at using maybe 15 to 30 horsepower, so fairly low power. A boat has to continually displace water, which is a thousand times denser than air. 
Therefore, a boat that's outfitted with, say, 100 horsepower often uses about 75 horsepower the entire time. This creates challenges in, <clears throat> in battery design and power electronics. Looking at how come we don't have all electric transoceanic vessels, how come we don't have all electric freighters or cruise ships, the issue here is we look at how long it takes a battery to discharge and how you size that battery. If you size a battery to discharge in a car, <clears throat> you're looking at discharging over a four to five hour period. If you're looking at doing it for a vessel, you can be looking at a 14 plus day period of discharge resulting in absolutely tremendous battery requirement. This directly correlates to cost and weight implications where if you were to outfit a cruise ship that's about a 2000 passenger cruise ship, the required all electric battery size for that would result in about a $600 million battery, which is really just not feasible at that scale. There are also environmental design challenges around marine electrification. First and foremost, you have a very corrosive environment with salt water. Second, zero failure tolerance. If you're in an electric car and something begins to go wrong, the system may sense that, stop the car and ask you to get out or warn you something's going wrong. And you can do that on a highway. In a boat, you can't really do that. Then there's high force impact. So when a boat is at speed in the ocean or on a lake, slamming up against waves, the hull often sees impact up to five Gs time after time after time, which in military applications becomes a big issue with keeping the driver safe. So these are other challenges that the automotive industry does not necessarily see. And lastly, adoption is a huge barrier in maritime. Just as we see adoption as an issue in the automotive industry, we see that in the marine industry. First and foremost, the, one of the biggest things I get from people, but electricity and water don't mix. That's absolutely true. They certainly don't mix. And for that, to get past that, we have a strong focus on safety requirements and making systems completely waterproof. So it's about educating the consumer that systems can be designed to be safe in electricity and water. Charging infrastructure is also an adoption aspect. Most people initially say, but there is no charging infrastructure on the water like there is on land. There is actually already a fairly established electrical power infrastructure. Many people trailer their boats from home, in which case they can always plug into a 110 volt outlet and slow charge overnight before going out. Or where people keep their boats at dock slips and marinas, they often have power pedestals for larger boats to keep their battery systems charged. So the smaller high-speed electric boats could plug into those. And lastly, on the adoption side, is understanding marine anxiety. So marine range anxiety already really exists with gas engines. So there's a company called Boat US that people buy subscriptions for. And with this Boat US subscription, people get, are able to essentially get free tows. And there are over a million people in the US who are signed up for Boat US. Inherently, boats are not going to go nearly as far as cars, and understanding the use case is extremely important when sizing and looking at adopting an electric system. Next slide. <clears throat> looking a little bit more at the technical side, um, we were talking about continuous discharge. So like we said, automotive versus marine, is rolling resistance versus aerodynamic drag against displacing water, where displacing water is always a lot more energy intensive. So because high discharge is continuously needed or high continuous power output, the batteries will inherently be heavier. And there are always trade-offs in batteries, whether that's for cost, cycle life, safety, power density, or energy density. In automotive, we see a lot of focus on increasing energy density because you don't need a lot of continuous power. In the marine world, we need higher power batteries that can continuously discharge without warming up. So when we look at batteries that need to be discharged at 1C, or what that means is at full power for one hour, it's not terribly difficult to find batteries like that if you don't care about weight. So batteries essentially, if you have higher power density, you need to sacrifice energy density and they get heavier. So what this leads us to is we need to really, really focus on efficient propulsion. No matter how you spin it, 
batteries are at least 50 times heavier on an energy basis than gasoline. So we need to get as much of that energy into forward momentum as possible through a very efficient system and driveline design. Looking more at those environmental challenges, the sea conditions really are unforgiving with constant salt spray, UV, and high impacts. Planing holes can see upwards of five Gs during slamming, and the packs have to be engineered for durability. So like we said, zero tolerance at sea, we can't walk away. So one of the most important things here is attention to connections at the system and cell to cell level. This is often one of the more common failure points when you see issues with electric cars and fires. A lot of it can be traced back to either cell to cell or module to module connections. So <clears throat> efforts here around redundancy and good QA, QC are instrumental. Moving deeper on that adoption side, once again, electricity and water don't mix. It's going to be a lot of education in e-mobility. As we're starting to see education on the automotive e-mobility side is really starting to change people's minds. And we see all these larger automotive manufacturers really shifting to electric fleets. Charging infrastructure, like we said, it really does exist for the most part. There are definitely corner cases, such as remote areas or moorings, that will require innovation, but there are companies working out there and we are working on innovations as well for those things. And lastly, understanding range anxiety. 95% of inshore and coastal trips are under 15 miles. <clears throat> Flux Marine is not initially addressing the big fishing boats that go out for days on days and hundreds of miles, but the vast majority of inshore and coastal boats. So looking at the next slide. And this brings us to our approach. So the key to developing an all electric propulsion system that outperforms gas engines is really to redesign the system from the ground up to utilize all the advantages of electric power. There are companies out there who are building electric marine propulsion systems for smaller recreational craft. There's innovation on the very small side, what we commonly refer to as trolling motors. And then there are companies building up to about 150 horsepower electric outboards. However, a lot of these companies are using gas engine shells and putting electric vehicle powertrains in them. The result here is something that is electric. It's something that does work and does have the power but it does not have the efficiency and it still has a lot of the pain points of gas engines. In order to build something that's truly suited for mass adoption and to cause a paradigm industry shift, we need to redesign from the ground up to really eliminate these pain points and increase efficiency in every way possible. So what Flux Marine has been developing is based around five concepts here. <clears throat> One is a specialized pack design. Often we'll see competitors using automotive battery packs. And as we discussed before, automotive battery packs are designed for low continuous discharge and high peak discharge. The results <clears throat> are inefficient charge discharge cycles. We use batteries that are more ideally suited for lower peak power, but higher continuous power. Second, our focus on a high output powertrain. If we look at a motor from say a Tesla Model S, that can produce close to 400 plus kilowatts in terms of acceleration power, that same motor can only produce 50 or 60 kilowatts continuously. In boats and marine, we really care about having high continuous power output. So our powertrain is optimized for that continuous power output and therefore it's able to be smaller, lighter, and less expensive because we don't have those high peak requirements. Cooling system is tremendously important. On traditional outboards, cool, <clears throat> traditional outboards are cooled through an impeller that actually sucks seawater in through its system and spits it out. This creates vulnerabilities for corrosion and early failure. We're developing a cooling system that's actually integrated into the physical structure of the motor and is single loop. So it requires absolutely no <clears throat> ingestion of seawater. The result is we are able to have higher heat rejection and eliminate maintenance. Traditional outboards also use a bevel gear system with mechanical shifting. We're able to replace that with electronic shifting and by implementing a synchronous belt drive, we are able to eliminate the need for lubrication 
lower our part counts, and increase, increase efficiency. Lastly, the high torque of the electric systems enable us to use larger, more efficient propellers with higher blade to area ratios. The key here is a lower spinning, a lower RPM propeller with a higher pitch is able to reduce cavitation. Cavitation often leads to efficiency losses. So as you can see here along every step of the way, we are really focused on increasing efficiency because any increase in efficiency results to longer range and less expensive systems. Next slide. <clears throat> so here we have a video of our current technology demonstrator. This is a 30 horsepower outboard motor on a 12 foot rib. As seen in this video, it's doing about 22 miles an hour. We recently won a 24 mile all electric boat race with this system against commercial competitors. At top speed, we've gone over 30 miles an hour. And at low speed, our range is pretty close to 200 miles. Next slide. Looking at our actual product line and what we are developing and intend to offer and go to market with is a line of electric outboard motors and battery systems from 15 to over 150 horsepower. We will initially be launching with a 15, a 40, and a 70, and shortly come after with 100 and 150. Just looking at some of the specs and how it might relate to a gas engine, in terms of the weight, we're looking at about 300 pounds for the electric outboard and the battery. This is actually a little bit lighter than equivalent gas system because a gas engine often weighs a lot more at over 200 pounds. You have a six gallon gas tank and a close to a 50 pound lead acid starter battery. Looking at range at high speed, around 30 miles, at low speed, pretty close to 200 miles. So at low speed, we significantly can out, out range a gas engine. At higher speeds, we're about 75% of the range. Our focus is to be versatile, so six hours of charging on a 110 volt outlet or plug into a 220 volt outlet or J1772 and get a charge in under two hours. <clears throat> One of the big performance aspects that we're focused on is acceleration. So in addition to the instantaneous torque that the electric has, it also has a peak power capability. So when our system is rated for 40 horsepower, that's the continuous rating. It can often produce 60 or 70 horsepower for peak bursts from anywhere from five to 30 seconds. So in reality, our 40 horsepower has the acceleration equivalent to a 90 horsepower gas engine. So on a small boat that typically has a 30 horsepower that you could never go skiing off of, with a flux screen 40 horsepower, you could probably pull up three or four skiers. There are a tremendous number of use cases for our motors. These include fishing, sailing, water sports, rental fleets, ecotourism, and the military. We're focused on a simple installation with standard mounting and steering, so it's very easy to retrofit existing boats or new boats with our outboard motor systems. Next slide. <clears throat> In order to get market adoption, we're really focused on addressing those pain points that a typical gas engine has. We're focused on zero maintenance for 10 years, <clears throat> true silence on an outboard motor, being able to have pretty close or equivalent range to what's offered on gas engines now, really focused on a low cost of ownership, simple charging is essential for adoption, and addressing all of those lakes that have banned gas engines, allowing people to use boats more than just trolling motors on tens of thousands of lakes. Next slide. Now, looking at the total market that we're addressing, the marine propulsion market is about a $5 billion market with over 380,000 propulsion systems sold. While there are only a handful of propulsion system companies, five or six, there are over 11,000 boat manufacturers in the US. So our focus was really to revolutionize an industry and to do that, we needed to be a propulsion system company. <clears throat> market trends indicate that outboards are becoming more and more popular as we can see there the vast majority of propulsion systems sold. We often break that down into low power, mid power and high power. So about half the market is <clears throat> falls into the category of low power and mid power, which are the motors that we are initially addressing. The mid power is the true market opportunity right now. 
because there is no electric motor that is a complete suitable replacement for a gas engine. Next slide. <clears throat> so to date, Flux Marine has been awarded about $275,000 in non-dilutive pre-seed funding, built four prototypes, we've won competitive races, and established several partnerships. We started back at Princeton in 2016 as an undergraduate research project. <clears throat> we got involved, we won some money at the Clean Tech University Prize in 2017, and then joined the Princeton University eLab Accelerator, which really helped us define our business plan. In February 2018, we officially incorporated, and then that summer, we were part of the Mass Challenge Accelerator, which is a really fantastic experience. This segued into us becoming a resident at Autodesk in the Seaport, which is a fantastic facility and allows us to be able to prototype for very, very low cost. We also established a partnership with Columbia University's Electrochemical Energy Center, which helps us bring cutting edge research to market in specific applications such as marine propulsion. Looking at the next slide. In, 2019, in October, we won the Y Island boat race. That was a 24 mile electric boat race against commercial competitors. We were part of the Clean Tech Open this past year where we were one of the four winners for the Northeast Regional and then went to the national competition where we won best in show, people's choice, and national runner up. A really great experience with a really fantastic group of people. <clears throat> we secured our first paid pilot customer, the East Bay Sailing Foundation, a group in Bristol, Rhode Island, that is building an all electric coaching boat for a Brown University sailing team. This is in conjunction with 11th, hours, 11th Hour Racing and their mission to create more sustainable solutions on the marine side. We're scheduled to deliver that motor as soon as the pandemic begins to ease up. We expect to do a pilot and beta test at the end of this year with Princeton University and the US National Rowing Team for their coaching boats. In 2021, our focus is to move to small batch production and the gold product launch in 2022. Looking at the next slide. Our team is really characterized by passion. <clears throat> I grew up on the water, had my boating license when I was 10 years old, and have been rebuilding old boats and old engines since before that. I grew up with Dalen Franton playing hockey. He spent every summer with me up on the lake. <clears throat> I was always the engineering side. He was the finance and accounting side but he still got his hands dirty and he still does today. John Lord, <clears throat> I met at Princeton. John was on the heavyweight crew team at Princeton University. He brings with him <clears throat> personal experience behind these gas engines and knowledge and experience in building everything from jet turbine engines to running manufacturing operations at a 3D printing company. Dalen has experience as an <clears throat> equity research partner at Manhattan Venture Partners. Jonathan and I both have research or both have research experience coming from Navitech, a marine defense engineering firm. I also bring with me experience from Tesla in their high voltage battery remanufacturing division. Our advisors range from some of the world's leading battery specialists <clears throat> to business development experts, entrepreneurs, and people very involved with the Office of Naval Research, connecting and finding solutions that are good for dual use essentially products that are have commercial potential but also dod potential both our founding team and our advisors are all linked by passion and excitement for our mission next slide <clears throat> one of the things that allows us to innovate at such a rapid pace are our committed partners first being the columbia university electrochemical energy center so one of our advisors, Professor Dan Steingart, was my personal advisor at Princeton University, and he is now the co-director of the new Columbia Electrochemical Energy Center at Columbia University. This allows us to really develop granular battery technology and testing, and our main focus and effort here is on safety. Safety is paramount, and the brilliant minds at Columbia help us ensure that safety is in our energy storage systems from start to finish. We currently spend most of our time doing prototyping at Autodesk in the Seaport District. As I mentioned, Autodesk is a fantastic resource that allows us <clears throat> to, to prototype for very, very low overhead 
and there's a fantastic community there with constant design reviews and positive feedback. Next slide. And then of course, one of the most important partners that has enabled us to continually move forward and de-risk our mission is the Massachusetts Clean Energy Center. As a recent <clears throat> recipient of the Catalyst Grant, we are developing a prototype demonstrator that will be the <clears throat> raced, hopefully in July, at the Multi-Agency Craft Conference, a Marine Technology Expo for an event called PEP, Promoting Electric Propulsion, that's funded by the Navy to showcase new electric marine propulsion technologies for dual use applications. The MassDEC has also enabled us <clears throat> to hire new interns and educate them, people from Boston University, Michigan, McGill, and Princeton, Students from all these schools have worked with us and are working with us to contribute to our mission of electrifying the marine industry. So we definitely thank the Mass CEC for all of their support. Next slide. And that's my presentation. Thank you very much everybody for listening. Would be happy to field any questions now. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, as a reminder to all the attendees, please submit your questions in the question box and then I'll ask them on your behalf. Um, to get the question started, um, I was wondering, so it seems like your team has a pretty um, packed upcoming schedule for commercialization. I was wondering like what specific technical questions you still have to answer in the upcoming tests and pilot demos. <clears throat> Great questions. So one of the biggest questions on the technical side is really going to be validation of reliability and durability. So really taking our systems and putting them in situations where they will not commonly operate, but should be able to operate. So no current gas outboard system right now can operate completely underwater. <clears throat> we expect for ours to be able to operate completely submerged, completely underwater. So we want to be able to test and have it submerged for hours at a time, ensuring that it still works. We need to ensure that if we're traveling at high speeds and we hit a rock or hit a log, that the system can take that sort of impact without any significant damage. So we'll have to be getting out there and actually hitting logs and hitting rocks and really testing the core durability of our systems. So those will be some of the technical validation questions that we still have to prove out as we go to commercialization. Got it, thank you. Um, one question that's come in um, is, if there is a need to revisit whole design in connection with electric repowering? Yes and no. So on one hand, in an ideal world, whole design being revisited is extremely beneficial in enabling electric propulsion because by nature, hulls displace water. There's a tremendous amount of energy and power required to push a boat, so you need a lot of batteries. In an ideal world, every boat becomes a foiling boat, which, become, which is very, very efficient. So there are a couple companies, and I am excited by and encourage companies to continue to innovate on the hull side to continually reduce drag and increase efficiencies. But at the same time, there are still so many, there are thousands of manufacturers that will not move to that kind of design, will continually make incremental improvements to efficiency. But in order to really revolutionize this entire industry from the propulsion system side, we need to make sure that we can adapt to newer, more efficient holes, as well as older style, less efficient holes. Got it, thank you. Um, then another question. What is your next big picture business plan? Um, so does Flux Marine intend to stay with just recreational boating and electric propulsion, um, or do you plan to expand to other products and potentially other industries? That's, that's a great question. And initially the focus is definitely to address this recreational pleasure craft industry because that's such a large untouched opportunity. There are a lot of efforts in, you know, how do we make the global shipping industry more efficient? There are very small boats that have trolling motors. This is an area that's really lacking attention. So our immediate focus is to kind of dive into this particular opportunity and market segment. 
Afterwards, though, we do expect to start to bring forth products that are that supplement our existing offering. So that's everything from <clears throat> hybrid range extenders to um, like moorings that can actually generate electricity for charging in those corner cases. And then longer term, looking at the types of technology we're developing with this high continuous power. The other parallel is actually the aviation industry. We're looking at an electric aircraft, those aircraft need high continuous power capabilities. So there may be a tangential for us to apply some of our technology in the future in the electric aviation industry. Very cool. Um, in regards to the batteries, how long do you expect um, the battery lifetime to be? And is there an associated replacement cost? with that. Yes, uh, absolutely. So no battery lasts forever as much as we'd like it to, but the batteries that we're currently working with have a life cycle that range anywhere from 3,000 to 4,000 cycles. So 3,000 to 4,000 cycles would have you on the water every single day, full, full tank for 10 years. So that's a tremendously long period of time if you're using the boat that often. At the end of the lifespan of the battery, whether it's the 10 years of extreme use or even 20, 25 years of still pretty common use, the battery would need to be replaced at that point, at which point I think 10 to 25 years, we'll see some very new different battery technologies that would come into play for replacement. Got it. Thank you. Um, and then what is your competition for electric motors in the recreational boating sector? So there are definitely an increasing number of companies that are getting involved with electric propulsion and these kind of low and mid power ranges for their recreational pleasure craft market, which also transcends commercial outboards as well. But we see a lot in the smaller kind of the trolling motor, <clears throat> the trolling motor segments, the under 10 horsepower. We don't really see these companies as competitors. There are a couple companies that are building larger outboards, and these companies most of the time are just taking gas engine shells and putting electric vehicle powertrain systems in them. So the results are very, very heavy systems. For example, one of our competitors, their 40 horsepower equivalent system weighs pretty close to a thousand pounds with the battery and motor included, whereas ours is just a tad over 300. There are a couple companies who are innovating from the ground up in kind of the 30 to 40 horsepower region. And these companies are, it's great to see these companies out there because it really indicates that there is market need. But the way we see it, there's still no competitor that's developed kind of a zero maintenance scalable architecture platform like we're developing for 15 to upwards over 100 horsepower systems, which would make us the leader in the space as we go to market. Great, thank you. Um, I think those are all the questions we have for now. Um, thank you again for kind of fielding all these questions, giving really great answers, and then also for this very interesting presentation. Um, I work on the Catalyst program and we're very excited to see um, what comes out of this project and um, it's also great to get an update on the other commercialization activities Flux Marine is pursuing. So thank yeah. you again. Fantastic. Thank you very much and for everyone who's listening, if anyone wants to learn more, please don't hesitate to reach out. Thank you again for the time for the Mass C from the Mass CEC and from everyone else. Yeah. Um, and then for all the other attendees on the line, we will have another presentation um, from Northeastern University on floating offshore wind turbines starting at noon. So um, feel free to stay on the line or um, rejoin at noon, um, but we'll take a brief intermission. Thank you.
Hi, everybody, and welcome or welcome back if you're with us for the last presentation. The next presentation is a Catalyst grantee. PhD Andrew Myers and Jim Papadopoulos will present on the novel floating wind turbine they're developing at Northeastern University. This technology costs less, can be quickly deployed in huge volumes, and has the potential to be cost competitive with fossil fuel generation. Thank you for joining us and please enjoy the presentation. Just as a reminder, all attendees are in listen only mode. If you have a question, please use the question submission feature and type it in as the presentation is happening and we can ask him on your behalf at the end. Thank you. All right, well, hello everyone. Um, so will you be advancing the slides or will I? I will be, yeah. Okay, great, and let me turn my webcam on here. Okay, good. Well, yeah, so uh, hi everybody. Thanks so much for the opportunity to uh, present our idea to you. Um, so uh, this is an idea that my co-inventor, Jim Papadopoulos and I invented um, about two years ago now. Um, and we were motivated, uh, the kind of premise of our idea is both of us, as I'm sure many of you do as well, sense the urgency of the climate crisis. And so we see offshore wind power, um, this abundant, steady resource so close to so many cities um, as a viable part of the solution to the climate crisis. Uh, and we look at the kind of current installation rates of offshore wind energy technology in the US and in the world. And we see it as just it's way too slow to meaningfully address the climate crisis in the uh, at the time scales that are necessary. So we were motivated to try to come up with something that could be installed at much faster rates. Uh, and we came up with two issues that we tried to improve upon in order to increase the installation rates. Those are the cost of offshore wind turbines. And so we came up with a design that we tried to make as cheap as possible. Um, and they're also the uh, kind of buildability of offshore wind turbines. Um, so at the moment, offshore wind energy technology is uh, difficult to build. It requires sophisticated manufacturing uh, technology and, and some, some key infrastructure. Uh, that is expensive and lacking. And so we tried to come up with something that could be buildable immediately um, without any kind of significant infrastructure upgrades. Um, so if you could go to the next slide, please. All right, and just let me move this out of my way. Oops. One second, there we go. Okay, so um, we're kind of motivated by a set of tantalizing questions. So I, I, I posed those questions here. So the first is, what if clean energy could be produced at something like a nickel per kilowatt hour, thereby becoming really close to the cost of, uh, the, of the cheapest fossil fuel uh, sources, natural gas, um, you know, getting, it, getting it quite close to, to that level? What if we could do that? Uh, what if we could produce clean energy in quantities sufficient to replace all of fossil fuel generation? Is there a renewable resource that's large enough and is there technology manufacturing capability to, to harvest at that scale? What if all this could be done with hardware that can be fabricated by existing businesses without enormous uh, infrastructure upgrades or capability upgrades that cost time and money? We kind of, if these things are possible, um, could they culminate in a green grid uh, in, a, in a time frame? before it's too late to uh, address the climate crisis. So could we have a green grid by 2050? Can you go to the next slide, please? So just to introduce ourselves, uh, I'm Andy Myers. Uh, I'm an associate professor of uh, structural engineering at Northeastern University. I'm a licensed professional engineer. Uh, I got my PhD from Stanford. Um, and for my entire career at Northeastern, uh, eight years now, almost nine years, I've been working on offshore wind energy uh, in one way or another. Um, including my sabbatical two years ago at the Danish Technical University. Uh, at their, they have an engineering department dedicated entirely to wind energy. It's a, it's a really um, interesting uh, arrangement, and I got to learn a lot from them uh, during my sabbatical. My co-inventor, who is on the line here to answer questions as well, is Jeremy. He goes by Jim Papadopoulos. Uh, he's a licensed professional engineer. He did his undergrad and PhD at MIT has been involved in uh, 30 years of uh, development and research in, um, in, in relevant manufacturing and engineering design uh, and issues like that. And over his career, he's accumulated, uh, he's been awarded eight uh, patents. As part of this Catalyst Award, uh, we are partnered 
with a marine fabricator out of East Boston. They're called Blue Atlantic Fabricators, and I showed a picture there uh, of their facility. And so it's a facility like that, a, a normal marine fabrication facility, where we are trying to let producers like that be able to make primary steel uh, that can serve the offshore wind energy industry, which with current technology is not possible. Uh, if you can go to the next slide, please. All right, so the overview of the presentation today um, is uh, first, I just wanna highlight some, some, some features of uh, offshore wind energy and note that its potential, the capacity potential is enough to uh, power the entire United States many times over. Um, I then wanna talk about conventional wind turbine designs and note how they are expensive and that they can neither be made nor installed in the United States with our current infrastructure. Uh, then I'll lay out our disruptive design. Um, so we, we did a, a from scratch design of a, of a floating offshore wind turbine and you can see the results on the right here in the image. Um, and our motivating factors were to make it as light as possible. And here weight is a good proxy for cost. So by making it as light as possible, we make it as cheap as possible. Uh, and we were also motivated to build it as quickly as possible. And those were our two motivating factors. Uh, I'll then go through some cost information, uh, noting how for the, for the portion of energy costs that can be attributed to the turbine, its foundation and its installation, which is the part where we've been innovating, we've been trying to reduce costs there, um, how we are targeting a 50 to 70% reduction in costs compared to existing technology. Uh, and then I'll lay out our catalyst award and how that fits in with our five-year development commercialization plan. Um, currently we're targeting something like $24 million, letting us develop and make a 10 megawatt uh, floating offshore wind turbine as a demonstration. And that's, that's our current path forward. You can go to the next slide, please. Okay, so this is a plot from uh, the National Renewable Energy Lab, which is indicating the uh, quality of the offshore wind energy resource along the, uh, along the US coastline. And so anywhere you see uh, red, uh, red is a world-class resource. Um, you know, th these are places, if you're familiar with, off with, with, with um, power production, they're places with capacity factors approaching uh, 50%. Um, and so it really is an abundant source. And, and you know, in New England, we are blessed with, with having an abundant resource very, very close to our shores. Um, and you can see on the West Coast as well. So if you look, the, the NREL report did a great job of assessing the, the, the uh, potential size of the wind resource in the United States. And so if you just look at a potential capacity, um, the energy along the US Atlantic coast alone uh, is enough to empower the entire United States. And of course, there are technological, technological issues with transmitting that power across the country. But if you're just looking at the capacity, and this is excluding uh, regions which uh, are already dedicated to uh, shipping or to military use, excluding all of those, uh, there's still enough power capacity just on the Atlantic coast for the entire country's energy demands. So it's an enormous resource. The other benefit of offshore wind generally is its availability. So unlike uh, onshore wind uh, sites, which are, uh, which are a great source of energy for this country, we can make energy cheaply with onshore wind um, generation, but we're, we're starting to use up all those great sites. Whereas offshore, there is abundant uh, available sites uh, still available. On top of that, the offshore wind resource is fortuitously located very close to uh, population hungry coastal cities. And that is a, the, the shorter you have to transmit the power, uh, the better. So having your resource located where the energy is used is an important benefit. So offshore wind power has developable sites near population centers. So that's offshore wind energy generally. Um, in particular, uh, we're very interested in, float, in, in floating wind turbines to harvest offshore wind power. So this is something, there's a few demonstration projects around the world of floating offshore wind turbines. Uh, the US doesn't have any, um, but lots of folks see a bright future for floating because it has some inherent advantages. Uh, first is you can do your construction at port where it is safer and cheaper than doing construction at sea um, where it's a lot more dangerous and more expensive. Um, so conventional technology, um, a, a lots of the installation, I mean, all of the installation uh, and, and, and assembly is done at sea. The other benefit is that a floating wind turbine is not as constrained to uh, shallow water depths. 
Um, so you can install floating turbines further from shore where the water is deep, and that has benefits of better wind resources, less visual impact. And if you think about the West Coast, the West Coast, unlike the Atlantic Coast, um, gets very deep, very close to the shoreline. So on the West Coast, there really is no possibility of using conventional fixed bottom offshore wind turbine technology to harvest uh, wind energy, offshore wind energy. On the US coast, um, we have a great resource in shallow water. So um, all of the current developments uh, are based on harvesting that energy uh, with fixed bottom technology. Uh, can you go to the next slide, please? Okay, so just to lay out what we see as um, problems with uh, conventional designs. So the first problem, and, and you know, we see these as, as um, issues that are uh, slowing the, uh, the rate of installation of renewable energy, uh, energy production. Um, and so, so the first is cost. A, uh, and, and these are numbers that we've taken from a 2018 National Renewable Energy Lab uh, report. So the cost of a conventional fixed bottom offshore wind turbine, the capital costs are $4.4 million per megawatt. Um, and there are really important, very useful subsidies uh, that the federal government has in place that, that makes this a little bit cheaper such that it can be um, a more viable uh, source as we develop the technology. That's for fixed bottom technology. Um, floating technology is much less mature. Uh, and so it is even more expensive um, than this $4.4 million per megawatt. So we're trying to make that cheaper. Uh, the second problem is the infrastructure. So conventional technology um, developed um, in Europe. Um, in the United States, we currently don't have the factories, the ports, or the installation ships needed to, uh, to make and install conventional technology. And of course, we can build it. We can definitely build it. It just takes time and money to, to do that. So these two factors combine uh, such that there's a low rate of uh, installation. Um, so if you look at the current rates planned for the United States, something like two gigawatts of capacity per year, uh, it's more than 100 years to displace 25% of the US electricity demand. And we want, to, we want to come up with an idea that can make that much, much faster, a faster rate of installation. So, on the left here, I've got two images showing conventional offshore wind turbine technology. The far left is showing a fixed bottom offshore wind turbine. And so you can see that the structure goes continuously all the way to the seafloor. And then next to that is showing a, a floating offshore wind turbine. Um, and you can see here that there's just uh, some mooring cables that are um, holding the floating turbine in position, but it's not connected directly to the seafloor. Now I hesitate to call the floating turbine a conventional technology because there's only a handful of uh, floating turbines in the whole world. But the first, the, the first demonstration uh, wind farm of floating technology is in Scotland and it uses a technology uh, borrowed from oil and gas that looks a lot like this, it's called a SPAR. So when you look at these two ideas and at a 10 megawatt capacity, the one on the far left weighs 3000 tons, 3000 tons of mostly steel, uh, and the one next to it weighs 10,000 tons of mostly steel. Um, you'll notice that the overall architecture looks an awful lot like an onshore wind turbine. Um, so one feature that, and, and you know, that makes a lot of sense because onshore wind technology has evolved over 40 years and it's gotten to a point that it's, it's, it's really great. Um, and so folks took that and tried to change as little as possible when they moved to offshore. And you know, there's a, there's a logic to that. Um, so one thing that was borrowed from onshore technology is that the, uh, the, the rotor plane, so those, those three blades there are called the rotor, the, the rotor needs to be able to orient to face the wind. And so that, that, that orientation, that, that rotation happens up at the hub level, up at the center of uh, rotation of those, of those blades. Um, and, and, and there's a good reason for that in onshore technology, but a consequence of that is that you have to make your tower very skinny. So the reason a wind turbine's tower is skinny is not for structural efficiency. It's because if your rotor is rotating up at the hub and you have to be able to, the rotor has to be able to take any position to align itself with the wind, then you need to have a skinny tower such that the, the blades of the rotor don't strike the tower as the rotor is orienting to face the wind. So 
there are reasons for that, but it leads to structural inefficiency and makes things heavier uh, than they would otherwise have to be if you didn't need a skinny tower. The other idea that's been taken from onshore is that both of these um, conventional ideas are trying to hold the rotor as rigidly as possible. And that's a, that's a nice feature and it's, it's, you can achieve that um, without too much consequence onshore. But when you start to get offshore, um, there are some major advantages if you would embrace the idea that your whole system is going to move with the waves, that, that you're not gonna try to hold the rotor rigidly. And if you can design for that, there are some benefits uh, that will be uh, realized because of that. So our idea is shown over here on the right. Um, and you can see we don't have a skinny tower. We have a broad and efficient tower that's supporting uh, our rotor. And the reason we can do that is because our entire system uh, is going to rotate um, to, orient, to, to, to face the wind. So just like a ship at anchor will naturally be, um, be pushed to a position that is downwind, aligned with the wind, our system is much like a ship at anchor. Um, and so it's free for the whole system to rotate the wind is going to push it into the downwind position will thereby uh, orient the rotor plane uh, in the proper position uh, with respect to the wind. So since the whole system is rotating, we're, we can make a much wider and more efficient support structure, which saves a lot of weight. The other idea that we are uh, promoting is that if you are willing to accept that your system is going to move in the waves, if you think you can design for your entire system moving in the waves, significantly moving in the waves, then you have the benefits of you can make your floating platform a uh, very lightweight and it can have a shallow draft. So when it's lightweight, that has savings in cost. Uh, and when it has a shallow draft, that means you can launch it in shallow ports without having to upgrade your ports uh, into, to have them be deeper. So those are our two kind of primary uh, innovations. If you go to the next slide, please. So our two enabling innovations are that our entire turbine system is gonna swing an anchor uh, to follow the wind. And we're not going to try to prevent wave motion uh, and all of the extra weight requirements that, 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 that come with that design objective. So these two enabling innovations have um, many uh, cascading benefits. Um, and we've listed out some of those here. I don't think it's, it's uh, worthwhile for us to, to talk about those right now. Um, but I do wanna highlight the last point is that um, all of this is conventional, well-known technology. Uh, it's just assembled in innovative ways. So, um, you know, lattice towers are, you've seen telecommunication towers that look a lot like our support structure towers. Um, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a conventional uh, technology. Um, and, and similarly for our mechanical systems as well. It's all conventional. We're just assembling it in a new scale, uh, putting it in a new environment and arranging things in a, in a novel way. Um, we, one of our design objectives during all this is to make this easy to make. And so everything in here is made from thin steel and thin steel is easy to, uh, to roll. It's easier to, to fold into different shapes. And so modest fabrication shops can work more easily with it than you can with conventional technology. If you go to the next slide, please. So some additional benefits. Uh, a lot of folks ask us about this idea of the whole system uh, aligning just like a ship at anchor to face the wind about how big of a area, uh, an ocean area that will take up. Um, and so you can imagine that as the water gets deeper, the circle that that system will, will move in as it aligns to face the wind will get bigger and bigger um, unless you have a, a buoy. So our idea in very deep water is we're gonna have a submerged buoy that's about hundred meters below uh, the water surface. And so we'll then rotate about that point, which would then limit our, our yawing radius uh, to about 170 meters, um, which is much smaller than turbine spacing. So there's no, there, there's no chance of these kind of crashing into each other if you were to make a, a farm because you would space the turbines at about a kilometer already. And we're just gonna be moving with a radius about 170 meters. Um, the other idea that, that, that we've incorporated in our design is that we have it moored our mooring line, which is the, 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 the line that connects uh, the system to the seafloor, uh, is attached to the system up near hub level. And so that has the benefit in that it is reacting uh, the wind loads 
right at the location where the, the wind loads are, are um, uh, acting in effect. So this has the benefit that as wind loads increase, if, if, they're, if they're mostly steady, that our system will just kind of sink deeper into the water. It's not going to tilt as wind loads increase. Um, and you know, that has some benefits in keeping your rotor plane vertical. Uh, if you can go to the next slide, please. Okay, so here is our understanding of uh, costs of a conventional uh, 10 megawatt offshore wind turbine. And these are all taken from a 2018 uh, NREL report um, that's shown here on the left, as well as our targets uh, for our floating idea shown on the right. So I'll highlight a few points here. Um, so like I said, this is from a 2018 National Renewable Energy Laboratory uh, cost of wind energy report. Uh, and they said that conventional fixed bottom technology at, at a 10 megawatt scale uh, involves a capital expenditure of $44 million, uh, O&M costs of $1.3 million per year, and a resulting levelized cost of energy of just a shade under nine cents per kilowatt hour. Now of those capital costs, um, more than half, 24 million, are com uh, uh, come from what we're calling the turbine system. So in gray is the structural mechanical components, in blue is the installation of those components, uh, and in orange is the uh, blades and power electronics uh, of the turbine. So that adds up to 24 million. Now, nearly equal to that in cost, according to NREL, are soft costs, um, additional balance of station costs from development and leasing, and a huge cost, um, the electrical infrastructure. So these are the subsea cables and the substations. Um, so uh, you can see that our thinking uh, is, oop, I'm seeing a chat here. Oh, okay, Jim is saying uh, O&M means operation and maintenance, about 33% of the electricity cost. Um, so all of our cost saving ideas are targeting the upper portions of, uh, of this cost. So the, the structural mechanical components and the uh, installation. And we've, we kind of uh, have a, a, a large range of what we're targeting because we have a lot we have to prove. Um, we have to prove that, that, that we can design for these motions uh, of this system uh, in the water. And so we're looking at a range of targets for a 10 megawatt system between uh, 500 metric tons and 1,000 metric tons. And, and depending on that range depends on our, our resulting costs. But in any case, our target for the structural for the for the turbine system itself is uh, eight to twelve million dollars for a ten megawatt system, um, and the the areas that we're not proposing any changes to, uh, mostly the electrical infrastructure, those costs get carried right over. So the end result is that for a ten megawatt turbine, we're targeting uh, twenty six to thirty million dollars uh, for our idea, uh, and we're we're also anticipating important. Uh, savings and maintenance. Um, with a floating system, you have the potential to tow it to, uh, to port and do the maintenance at port where it's uh, safer and easier than it is at sea. So we're targeting maintenance reductions uh, shown there. Um, so for this a 10 megawatt system uh, between uh, 600000 and $800,000 per year and the resulting levelized cost of energy, depending on our, uh, our weight targets, is a shade below a nickel to a shade below six cents per kilowatt hour. If you go to the next slide, please. We're also targeting uh, rapid build out. Um, so over here is on the left is showing uh, conventional uh, technology, which is uh, very thick steel rolled to huge diameters and you need very specialized facilities to make this. Um, on the lower left is a jack up ship and this is the vessel that would install a conventional offshore wind turbine. Um, it literally sends down supports to the seafloor, jacks itself up, and then gives itself a nice stable base for a crane that can then assemble uh, a wind turbine. Um, so both of these are specialized equipment, and it's currently only available in Europe. Um, our, we've targeted our, our system to be uh, made entirely from thin steel, so a modest fabricator uh, like Blue Atlantic Fabricators could, could make this. Um, and the fact that we have the shallow draft means that uh, our system can be launchable uh, without uh, having an extra deep port. If you can go to the next slide, please. Um, so uh, we've also thought through uh, the assembly uh, of our system and its launch. 
so our assembly, uh, we're targeting uh, the ability to assemble this without a heavy overhead crane. Uh, that's a significant limitation because uh, because the real heavy overhead cranes are kind of few and far between. Um, and so we have this idea that we will uh, will kind of lift the system up from the base and it'll slowly kind of grow from its base uh, until it's up to its full uh, height. Um, and then we're imagining that it'll be supported on air cushions that then if we're on a kind of sloped entry, we can just uh, have it roll right into the water. Um, so uh, kind of like how a, a ship is launched um, on kind of sloped, a ship is launched on sloped rails. Um, we're envisioning something similar uh, here. If you can go to the next slide, please. Um, so the size of the market uh, at currently planned US installation rates of about 210 megawatt turbines per year, uh, it's about $5 billion of capital uh, expenditures per year. With our design, which we anticipate cost savings, it's about one to $2 billion. At the rates necessary to green the grid by 2050, uh, the size of the market is much larger. And that's just the US, the international market is much uh, larger than that. Um, so our competitive advantages, we're targeting a 35 to 45% reduction in levelized cost of energy. Um, we're targeting the ability to make these with local manufacturing without significant upgrades to capabilities, no upgrades to ports, uh, eased maintenance from uh, repair by quick swap and towing, um, and much easier installation. Uh, if you can go to the next slide, please. So our five-year development plan, uh, we are very grateful for Catalyst support, which is supporting uh, our first year here, 2020. Um, so over the past two years, our basic engineering is completed and we've um, filed for uh, our, our patent application. Um, as part of this launch phase, the Catalyst phase, uh, we want to de-risk our wave behavior and cost estimates, uh, create a commercial entity. Uh, and something I want to highlight here is we are currently looking for a uh, business-oriented uh, CEO and co-founder. Um, I'll, I'll highlight that on the next slide. But so as part of our launch, uh, as part of our launch, we are planning. Uh, we're actually in the process right now of building a one to sixty scale prototype that will test at the University of Rhode Island um, as soon as the world resumes uh, normalcy. We are just about ready to go with that. Um, and we're also doing some advanced simulations. So uh, this is just a, a, a snapshot of a computer simulation we've done of one of our conical floats uh, in a wave environment. Um, so if you can go to the next slide, please. Um, so anyone on the call now who has any ideas uh, or, or you know, people who you think might be a good fit for joining us, we are eager to find a co-founder um, with, uh, uh, with a business uh, background. Um, so the kind of responsibilities that we're anticipating for this person is fundraising, establishment of a startup entity, um, management of operations and our demonstration projects that we have planned, uh, development of a commercialization strategy, cultivating strategic partnerships and soliciting contracts. Um, so anyone who has any interest in, we have a, we have a job description written up, uh, I'd be happy to forward that to you. Um, if you can go to the next slide, please. So after the catalyst phase, um, that's when we're looking for uh, some serious fundraising. Um, so about a year from now, uh, we wanna start phase one, which is a $3 million phase. It lets us uh, design, build and demonstrate our system at one third scale. Um, and we'll do survival testing at sea in order to, uh, to learn things about our system and, and demonstrate to folks that our ideas are credible. Um, can you go to the next slide, please? The second phase then goes um, a little over a year, starting in 2022. Uh, here we design and build and, uh, and demo our system at full scale, so 10 megawatt scale, but excluding all the power electronics, which are a huge part of the cost. So we will then use the demonstration power um, to just do something uh, like have a, have a dummy load, like make steam or something like that, because there, this lets us demonstrate at 10 megawatts much more cheaply than if we were to make electricity, because there's enormous costs associated with the electrical infrastructure. So this lets us get a 10 megawatt turbine in the water um, and you know, making power, but, but just making steam with that power uh, instead of making electricity. Um, well, you know, important to explore strategic partnerships here um, and then survival testing of our full system at sea is an enormous thing that we need to demonstrate to get, uh, to, to kind of convince people that our ideas are credible. Um, if you can go to the next slide, please. And then the final phase, phase three, is uh, the most expensive. It's nearly two years long. 
uh, $14 million. Uh, and here we want an electricity generating 10 megawatt turbine uh, demonstrated uh, that it can work at sea. Um, and then, you know, multiple commercialization ideas um, that we hope to develop as part of this uh, partnership with a CEO slash co-founder uh, are on the table for advancing things um, after we've demonstrated. Uh, so yeah, current thinking is a five-year development timeline um, costing $24 million and uh, accelerated deployment possible at greater cost. All right, if you can go to the next slide, please. Yeah, so that's our, um, that's a kind of an overview of our idea. Um, I appreciate the chance to uh, share this uh, with you all. I also appreciate the chance to uh, talk a little bit more at length. Uh, usually when I'm presenting this idea, I have 10 minutes. And so it was nice to have a little bit more time. Um, Jim and I are happy to receive questions now. Thank you. Um, this is Corey from SEC. Um, a reminder to all the attendees to please submit any questions you have in the question box, and then I will ask them on your behalf. Um, so one of our first questions is, um, if you could please advise on the mooring system in a bit more detail. Um, is it piled or does it use anchors, et cetera? Sure. Jim, do you want to handle that? Looks like my camera is dead, but can you hear me? I can, yes. Okay, so the what we're thinking is plate anchors, which are dragged to uh, to settle into the sediment. Um, it depends on the, the angle which the cable will take relative to the anchor, whether it gets pulled out. But so, sort of our first uh, impulse is to look for the lowest cost, easiest to install setup. And then if it tur turns out there's a, a technological problem, of course, uh, we would have to go to piles. Got it. And would that impact the type of ship you would use at all? Well, my understanding is that laying a, laying a plate anchor is a matter of dropping over the side and, and tugging it so it seats itself. So that's not a special ship as far as I know. Got it. Thank you. Um, and then would you be able to describe the conical floats a bit more? Okay, so the need for the floats, you know, we need uh, spaced apart floats to give this stability so it doesn't tip over. So they're spaced apart and then the system is structurally efficient because the legs go right to the floats. Now, how big do those floats have to be? Well, if, if we manage the 500 or 800 ton system, then the floats don't really need that much volume. And then the kind of lowest cost comes when your float is kind of boxy, not, not wide and flat, not tall and skinny, but sort of equal height and width. And uh, we look at cylindrical, you know, welded, it's steel bent and then welded together. And the trouble with the cylindrical float is the flat bottom doesn't take the pressure. It's, uh, it's structurally inefficient, but a cone takes pressure very well. So that's the simplest um, efficient structure we've come up with that we think that the, the, that the, that the plate can be either rolled or cut in segments to make a kind of pyramidal or conical shape and be welded in the, in the modest uh, fab shop. And um, we hope it doesn't need any internal bracing, but of course there are details we'll have to work out by putting specific wave loads on a planned float and deciding if it's really as cheap as we think to, to carry this, carry the loads. I'll just add a, a couple points. Um, so, uh, you know, our, our thinking is dominated by structural efficiency, by reducing cost. And we have these, um, we're, you know, float shape is something we'll be exploring in our uh, wave tank tests. Um, the shape is really efficient. You know, one consequence though is that you can see that our kind of waterline area, as we submerge more and more, because our diameter decreases as we go up, uh, our waterline area will also decrease. So, as if we push past the equator, we get a decreasing heave stiffness, and so it's just kind of a um, a uh, a factor that is you know something to consider, uh, and we're going to be looking at it in the wave tank tests. Great, thank you. Um... And then another question on the 
current and potential future impacts of COVID-19. Um, do you expect this to delay any of the five phases in your project? Yeah, so I mean, the only phase that has funding and a plan, a, a fixed plan, is the catalyst phase. Um, and so uh, I, the numerical work we've been able to, um, you know, our cost modeling, our numerical work in uh, ANSYS, that's proceeding almost unaffected. I mean, so our, all our meetings are virtual now instead of in person, but besides that, very little effect. The wave tank tests, I mean, we have no access to URI's facility uh, until all this passes. Um, so, you know, we're, we're working to build the prototype out of our homes right now. Ideally, that should be in a shop too. Um, so the wave tank tests are disrupted, but we're optimistic by late summer, early fall, we can, we can get those done. Great. Um, and then what are the challenges associated with an exposed belt drive? Yeah. Should I take that? I think so, Jim. So I, I want to make a make a clear point that in our initial uh, vision for this, we drove for the very lightest possible design and tried try to take, tried to see what might be the limit of how light you could get. And one of those possible steps was very attractive to a mechanical engineer, which is get a belt drive rather than a gearbox because it saves 80 tons and a million, you know, a million and a half dollars, some, some very big numbers, okay? Having said that, um, I'll talk a little bit about the engineering, but you sh it should be clear that we can always go and use a more or less conventional gearbox. So that's part of, when the weight is uh, 500 tons to 1,000 tons, well, maybe you keep a conventional gearbox, and so you've added 100 tons, something like that. And uh, same, we've have the cost range. We could be we could be using a gearbox. So I just want to emphasize that we're not tied to a belt. But having said that, I'm excited about the belt because it's much cheaper. It should be um, kind of overload tolerant in that it would slip. It would slip and scuff. And we're looking at the metallurgical properties of the belt to make sure that would be tolerable. Um, and uh, let me think what else. It gives, a, it gives an automatic speed up without gears, all right, while transmitting the power down to a generator that is then accessible to maintenance. So we kind of like getting power down on deck. The picture we drew with an exposed belt is not the way it would happen. There have to be wind shrouds because any kind of ribbon will flutter in the wind and we want to keep the rain and the salt spray off the belt. So I don't know if there's a more specific question, but the real thing, the belt, you wouldn't see the belt. And of course we have to work out the, the means of changing the belts, preventive maintenance, which, which we hope we could do in like half a day. Um, there are other questions which I'm happy to, happy to address. I don't want to go on at length without them. Thank you. I think that's a good answer. Um, and then another question is regarding um, wind shadow and if um, there's concern about there potentially being a wind shadow from the lattice structures and um, resulting noise as has been found in the past with land-based wind turbines and um, downwind rotor orientation. Yeah, I'll, I'll offer a few comments on that and Jim, follow up that when I'm done, please. Um, yeah, so as you can see, we have, we've divided the support structure into equal parts upwind and equal parts downwind. We have four legs of our support structure, two are upwind, uh, two are downwind. Um, the, uh, you know, one thing we like is that the fact that our, our support structure is now open is that overall, the kind of projected area that the wind sees from, uh, in of our support structure is lower than with a tubular tower. But of course, there are going to be uh, shadowing effects because we now have, uh, we have upwind towers um, and their influence on fatigue, uh, on noise issues, on uh, power production. Um, those are some open questions, um, but we're kind of motivated by the fact that overall, the, the area of solid area that the wind is seeing is reduced with an open lattice tower compared to a uh, closed uh, tube tower. Um, I had one other point I was going to make, but I'm forgetting it right now. But so, Jim, do you want to add anything? Well, yeah, I, I do want to talk some about that because the lattice tower 
looks like about the most structurally efficient form. That's why they use them for big uh, radio radio antennas. On the other hand, um, you know the the chance for corrosion is greater and bird nests and um, maybe ice buildup. So it's not a done deal that what we what we think is the cheapest. That's not necessarily the one we end up with. That's the first point. The second thing is that um, some aspects of wind shadowing, you know, we've we've thought we certainly thought about it. Um, one aspect one aspect of that is you you decrease wind shadow effects if you provide some streamlining, like pla just plastic shrouds over your structural elements. So we think that whatever the wind shadow would be, we can probably drop it significantly with. Um, Kind of wind aligned wind aligned plastic fairings uh, but that's very speculative um enough you know in, in a sense the whole thing is speculative of course we haven't built one but the other part of the analysis we want to do is that uh although we haven't said it the blades the blades on this thing are meant to be pitched or changed in uh kind of rotated along their long axes around their long axes they're they're meant to be pitched on the fly as the as the rotor is turning and it, it looks like there'd be an opportunity to wiggle the blade slightly when it goes past a wind shadow and not therefore generate the loads because you quick you briefly uh briefly reduce the angle of attack and then switch it back so it's all speculative um and uh and and we're going to find out more with analysis and testing Great, thank you. Um, another question, I think you briefly touched on the metallurgical product properties um, of the turbine, um, but one specific question in regards to how your steel compares to steel from conventional turbines in terms of rust and lightning resistance, et cetera. Yeah, we, we are at the moment um, planning to use conventional steel so you know the, the conventional offshore steel from europe is s350 um you know the that or something comparable is very likely to be uh the type of steel that we use and so uh in terms of lightning protection there should be no no difference in in uh in the material properties um corrosion i wouldn't there aren't necessarily i mean so uh corrosion protection is a huge part of of offshore wind turbine design um, and there are active and passive systems, lots of coatings, lots of research and thinking goes into protecting uh, off conventional offshore wind turbines from corrosion. Um, and so, you know, a lot of that will apply to us. Um, the, the one issue Jim mentioned where we will be different and we'll probably have more issues with corrosion that we'll have to think through is the fact that we have this kind of uh, detailed faceted structure that will have all sorts of, uh, a lattice structure will have all sorts of little spots where, water could collect or things like that. And so uh, a lattice structure compared to a closed tube is a more difficult uh, structure to prevent corrosion. Um, but for the most part, the kind of conventional technology for resisting corrosion will be applying. Yeah, I, I'm gonna add, um, of course, all kinds of structures are made of steel and then painted. So that's the kind of default, the default idea we have. But, you know, I, I have a friend who's made a very good very good case for maybe a, a fiberglass leg and if the cost is not more than double um that you know a, a tubular fiberglass leg could be um could be a very cost effective long long lived um, solution great um and then one point of clarification um where is the generator located well, in the, in this in this image, which is our sort of our cheapest, this is our cheapest vision. It's the it's the way we cut the most cost and weight. And in this image, if you look at that belt going down from the center of the rotor, and it goes down, down, down to a little tiny platform where there's a little tiny generator, well, 10 megawatt generator. So that's our current um, like most extreme vision doesn't have to be built this way, but it puts the generator down where people can uh, maintain it easily. And, uh, and it has, uh, it, it saves the weight of a gearbox. And the alternative, of course, is we go to kind of more normal practice and put the put a gearbox and a generator up high, 
which we haven't shown in this picture. Great, thank you. Um, I think those are all of the questions we have for today. Um, thank you both for coming and presenting virtually. Um, it's a very interesting presentation. It's great to hear um, the progress you're making on the Catalyst project. Um, we certainly look forward to seeing the results of that. Um, yeah, thank you again. Yeah, thank you guys. If I could add, if I could add a word, if uh, if anybody has a suggestion or a question they want to reach out, I'm I'm happy to share my email. Yep, they're they're on the screen there. If anyone could, wants to grab it really okay. quickly. Thank you. Yeah, th thank you, um, everyone. And it was, was that Corey who was talking? Um, so yeah, th thank you yeah. for arranging this, and uh, uh, it was a it was a great opportunity. Great. Yeah. Have a great day, both. And thank thanks. you to all the attendees for the great questions as well. Hey, thanks. Hi, everybody, Goodbye. thank you.